Another classification scheme is size classification. And whether we know it or not, most of us use a size classification scheme to categorize sediment. The most widely used scheme is called the Uden-Wentworth scale, and you're familiar with it even though you didn't know it was called the Uden-Wentworth scale. It's a logarithmic scale of sediment sizes, and it spans six orders of magnitude, and let's take a look at it. Most of us are familiar with boulders, cobble, gravel, sand, silt, and clay, and these are words I'm sure you've heard before. Maybe you didn't know they have official size classifications, but here we see in figure 5.9, Uden-Wentworth scale, that we classify sediments according to these different sizes. Now, if you're familiar with a colander in a kitchen, you may be familiar with one of the ways in which scientists determine the size of sediments. We simply put them in what's called a sieve. A sieve. And it, by shaking that sieve or running water through it, we can determine the proportions of different kinds of sediments, different sizes of sediments, in a particular sample. The Uden-Wentworth scale. Well, you may or may not have thought about it, but if we go back to this picture, what would you guess would be the kind of environment that would allow clay to exist versus a kind of environment that would allow boulders or cobbles to exist or even sand for that matter so think about this for just a minute if you were to blow on a tabletop you might make that dust fly away but if you were to blow on a boulder, you wouldn't move that boulder at all. So it shouldn't be too big of a stretch to see that clay and silt are characteristic of very low energy environments. If there's a lot of energy, the clay and silt aren't going to be deposited. They're going to be carried away by the water or blown away by the wind. On the other hand, where do you find most boulders and cobbles? Upstream, in the middle of a river. So it's that action, it's that amount of energy that determines what kinds of sediments we'll have in a particular location and turning that around if we find silt and clay in a particular set of deposits we know that that was a very relatively low energy environment if we find mostly gravel and cobble in a particular sediment sample then we know that it was a higher energy environment so you should be able to start putting two and two together to see how size sediments or size classification of sediments can tell us something about the environment in which these sediments were produced. Collectively, those processes that create, transport, or, or allow sediments to be deposited on the seafloor are called sedimentary processes. So we want, want to take a little bit of a look at that because the types of sediments produced, so not only the sizes but the types, their movements away from where they originated and where they end up really depend on so many different things the meteorological and oceanographic conditions and so by the time sediments get to a particular location in the world ocean they've undergone all kinds of little uh, movements and they've been carried into different places so kind of like the story of how you ended up in a particular place unless you've lived here all your life sediments have that same kind of story so when we find sediments at the bottom of the ocean what we want to do is look at them and say where did you come from how did you get here and who are your parents? And that's really the goal of paleoceanographers. So if we look at the life history of a sediment, from their origin to where they were deposited, we call that the sediment cycle. And I don't want to belabor this, but of course plate tectonics and climate change and all these things influence the sediment cycle at every step. Let's compare the sediment cycle for lithogenous particles or particles that originate from rock. This is figure 510 in your book. So weathering of parent rock, what that means is anything that breaks down mountains essentially, and that might be rainfall, it could be acid rain, it could be winds, it could be earthquakes, it could be you going out with a hammer and beating on the rocks, that's called weathering, that creates the sediments. Wind or water transports those sediments and eventually it brings them and carries them into the ocean. When they get into the ocean, they may sink. 
if they are carried by wind, we call those aeolian particles. So one sediments that travel by river are called riverine particles or riverine sediments. Wind is called aeolian particles. And of course, it should make some sense to you that wind is not going to carry boulders and cobbles unless it's really a screaming wind like 500 miles an hour. We don't get those kinds of winds on our planet. So wind is going to deliver smaller sediment sizes than rivers. Okay, so kind of think about that. Those particles, as they sink, they may actually stick together, a process called aggregation. If they stick together, that may make them sink faster, and they may stick together because an animal says, I like that particle, I want it, and it starts collecting particles for its house. Or those particles may be broken apart, either by wind or wave action, or in the ocean it will be wave action or some kind of recurrent, or, or again, organisms breaking down, or perhaps chemical processes start to dissolve those sediments and they break apart. So any of those kinds of things can happen. Aggregation, coming together of sediments, fragmentation, breaking apart of sediments as they make their way down to the seafloor. Well, as they make their way down to the seafloor, they pile up, and as they pile up, they're put under greater pressure, and eventually they become rock, and that process is called lithification. And in the meantime, as they're piling up, they may be worked on by chemical processes. The piling up may create different kinds of chemical processes and organisms may also interact with those sediments and those kinds of chemical and biological transformations that happen as sediments are sitting on the seafloor is called diagenesis. And of course, as I said before, through seafloor spreading, these sediments are eventually brought into a subduction zone where they're melted and the whole thing starts all over again. Okay, well, we can also take a look at biological sediments. Organisms remove elements that are brought to the ocean by rivers, so dissolved elements find their way into the ocean organisms take the substances, take the elements that they need to build their shells and their homes and create a sediment. Those organisms may be eaten, uh, they may be broken apart by natural processes, or they may just die and they may sink and they may aggregate and they may fragment. The, through the process of organisms eating the waste products of other organisms, or to put it in blunt terms, eating poop or coprophagy, those sediments, those biological sediments, may be even further reworked. So a number of things can happen to biological particles as they sink into the water column. Of course, they then may decompose. Those, that organic material, just like a leaf litter, may decompose on the seafloor. It may undergo diagenesis, so it may undergo some kind of chemical transformation or biological transformation as it's in that pile of sediment on the seafloor and eventually when the sediments pile up and create enough pressure they become lithified and turn into sedimentary rock which is why we have to drill for them and that sedimentary rock can then again be subducted and eventually melted and the whole thing starts all over again and finally the other important part of this figure 510 is just to take note of hydrothermal vents. As that hot seawater circulates through cracks in the seafloor near oceanic ridges, it accumulates different kinds of metals and other types of elements and that hot superheated mineral laden water is then pumped out in a hydrothermal vent and those minerals upon encountering the cold seawater precipitate. Okay, and so here we have a source of chemical sediments. So we have the lithogenous sediments, biogenous sediments, and chemical sediments all produced in the ocean and all deposited in the world ocean. So this should give you some idea of by looking at sediments, we can start to piece together all these different sedimentary processes that went into the creation and deposition of that sediment on the seafloor.